Abdullah, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Also, I apologize for being a few minutes late. Um, first of all, yeah, just a couple of corrections on the introduction side. I don't hold a PhD uh, degree from Princeton. I was doing a PhD there. Uh, I actually will tell the story how it went uh, and how I started the company. Um, and thank you everyone for taking the time to actually join the call. Maybe I just uh, turn on the presentation and go over and then feel free to stop me anytime and ask me any questions. Can you see the deck? All right, great. Um, so yeah, feel free to stop or uh, write in the chat and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Today, I'm going to chat about uh, maximizing GPU utilization and model accuracy with data-centric AI practices. I bet there are so many different words on the title, so try to uh, clarify. But the most important thing what I want to talk about is actually the importance of the data sets themselves when you actually train and deploy your machine learning models. Just to give you a brief background, as uh, Blah mentioned, uh, before starting the company, I was doing a PhD at Princeton University. I was in a neuroscience lab working with a lot of unstructured data. And when I talk about unstructured data, I mean about images, video, audio, or anything that's not basically tabular or maybe semi-structured data like just JSON or hierarchical data sets. And the problem that we had is that we were like sort of operating in the dark. We had um, so like we had order of uh, petabyte or hundreds of terabyte scale data sets uh, sitting either on a local like a data center or on a cloud. And it was very hard for us to operate on top of these data sets. If you go into look into the traditional like how developers are used to work with databases today, they have very common frameworks uh, like SQL databases or NoSQL databases. They can easily store their um, structured data. But if you start talk about with images, the way we operate with images is the same way as we open our laptop and then put a JPEG file on a folder and then we work with that. The problem that we had, and I was in a neuroscience department and we were analyzing um, images of a mouse brain. So what we were doing is that we were taking a mouse brain, cutting into very thin slices, imaging each slice and each slice was 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. And we had 20,000 of those slices. So the amount of the data that we were getting was operating at a petabyte scale. It was very hard for us to take this data set and apply machine learning models, more specifically deep learning models to be able to segment the, new, the neurons, find the connections and then build the graph. So later neuroscientists can actually do research to understand how the brain works. Like, I don't, I'm not sure how much familiar you are, but like in machine learning and in deep learning specifically, one of the most famous algorithms that we use is basically this back propagation algorithm that uh, decides how to update the weights of the parameters of a model. And one thing you can prove through this method where you look into a mouse brain, like the connections or the connectomics of, or connectom of the mouse brain, you can actually understand how the brain is wired. And if let's say potentially back propagation exists inside the real brain or not. And it appears that it's actually not in the current form and the main goal of the whole this neuroscience research was to try to understand how the brain learns, how the neurons actually connect to each other and how the learning hap uh, happens inside the brain. But coming back to me being a computer scientist in a neuroscience lab, the problem that we were facing was like this uh, processing this data at scale was costing us a lot of money. And we had to try to make this uh, like four to five times cheaper by rethinking how actually the data should be stored, how it should be streamed from the storage to the computing machines, what kind of pre-processing algorithms should be used, should we use models, like what kind of models should we use. And um, this kind of insights helped us to start the company, then apply to uh, Y Combinator, get there three years ago, move to Bay Area, and actually focus on solving this challenge on understanding um, how we can make data sets better that in turn will actually help us to uh, make models much more efficient and uh, more powerful. And that's what basically we do is that we help um, companies um, take their unstructured data, structure them, and I'll later explain how, how they, that we are doing. But even before getting there is that you can see that um, actually a wonderful, I'll say, uh, invention has happened like last 10 years or maybe a rediscovery what actually has been already invented is that deep learning models are very useful for extracting 
insights or business insights from our structured data. And um, past 10 years, we have been really focused on understanding how we can take the very basic computer vision um, or in like natural language processing models and try to improve those models by improving on benchmarks to get, to get higher accurate models, by rethinking like how the model should work. Like you, you have heard about recent likely transformers, which is the most famous model now operating across all uh, model stocks. Before that, it was convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. So we have like as a research community spent so much time on optimizing models, but the real thing is that we have kind of saturated the domain. However, if you look into the papers who actually focus on trying to optimize the data sets, it's order of here, like, I don't know, 40 times less than the amount of the attention that has been spent on improving the models. And we are now at the tipping point where we are saying, okay, the models are good enough. And there's like the improvement there is like incremental. Can we actually take a step back and try to optimize the data sets? And if you look into the kind of the hottest trends of this um, year is that kind of data centric way that Andrew in, um, famous professor from Stanford um, is pushing for is that if you have better quality data, then in, you have this cascading effect of having a better preci precision models. And if you look into some of the benchmarks or examples um, that the community has provided is that you can use AutoML, which is like automated machine learning on top of the models, and they actually improve the uh, model accuracy by maybe two or three, maximum up to 5%. But if you do the same thing on the data sets by trying to understand what is a data set exploration space that you can look into and try to make the best, then the optimization you can get is up to uh, from like from 5%, like there's this kind of a minimum to actually to 15 or 20% on the models on the same problems that you are working on. And that's what um, the companies um, specializing at where we do provide a solid data foundation for AI um, by providing a very simple API for creating, storing and collaborating on AI data sets, helping you to rapidly transform and stream data while training models at scale and also instantly exploring and visualizing data sets for AI. And all this for making, to get more accurate and cost-effective AI models. Just to take a step back here, want to mention that most of this technology is open source. So um, this is more or less about sort of an advertisement and more about exploring how we can actually take data sets using the tools that we do have and improve it better. Um, but before getting step, stepping into um, how that, um, like basically the, what the tools look like, let's take a step back and see what we are doing here or how, how the technology works behind the scenes. So we have the open source um, Python package, which is like taking any data set you have. Let's say you have million images and you also have million labels of um, identifying if the image contains a dog or a cat. And usually the way you store this data, you store it either on a local machine if you have enough space or you actually store it on a cloud on let's say AWS S3 um, uh, file by file. And the problem with that approach is that taking this data and then putting onto a machine to train a model, more specifically to use GPUs to train the model, you have to copy those files one by one um, into this machine to do that. And we will see later how it does. What we do instead, we take actually these million images and then treat them as large NumPy arrays or tensors um, both you have like now two tensors. One tensor is just like million by 512 by 512 by three. This is corresponding to the images. And you have another tensor, one million by one, which is like now labels. So in deep learning and machine learning just becomes learning a function that goes from the first images, image tensor to a label tensor at scale. Um, and you can easily connect to your favorite uh, deep learning framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow to do that. I think the main conceptually, the way you look into the data itself it, is just you abstract away from operating on files or for operating on compression types and thinking of different ways you can actually hierarchically represent the data. So you kind of, um, the data scientist no longer has to worry about all these aspects. 
So as I mentioned, like the way it's currently happening is that you have this data set sitting somewhere and then you have your own laptop or you have a notebook running on the cloud or you have a training job that runs the training and inference job. Every time you start a new instance or start to work on the like prototyping a model, you have to actually copy this data set from one location to another location. You have to like copy the machine, even when you start a multi-GPU training job, each of these nodes that you start with, they actually have to copy the data to the machine. And let's say, assume that on your laptop, you actually figured out a better transformation or a new, you want to add more data sets or you have figured out you have to label the data. Now you have to go and copy this data again to all of those machines and make sure that the data is synchronized. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like the way we were 30 years ago, we were going to a store, getting a DVD um, to take, I mean, 30 years ago, like the DVD was not there, but um, like the cassettes we had to go and bring it and then used to bring home and start watching um, a movie. And the, the new kind of the paradigm that we were saying is that now we can actually do the ways like Netflix is doing streaming this data to the machines while the machine actually needs the data to do the, to do the processing. So now you have a laptop sitting on your machine or a notebook running on your machine or a notebook running on the cloud, or maybe you have a multi GPU training job using PyTorch that's training on the cloud. Instead of copying this data every time before you start the computation or do the processing, now you can actually stream the data to your machine whenever the computation is, is needing. In that case, you are sort of keeping your data in a centralized space, but you can run distributed computation effortless, effortlessly on the cloud at scale. Now, instead of your machine having a view of, let's say 100 GB um, file system that has locally, now it can actually see a petabyte scale like a thousand times or hundred thousand times bigger data set view and then start operating as if this data was local to the machine. Let me bring you an example to be more concrete here. We partner with um, Google Brain Research Team on their ob object on data set. And what we do here is that we take they have a very famous objector data dataset with a bunch of images um, and also like the 3D bounding boxes across these images so they can look into the image and then try to recognize our, um, objects inside the image. And if you want to give an access to this data set, you actually have to, we have seen people spending 41 hours on going this, copying this data, um, taking the, uh, moving it from the, their Google cloud storage to their local machine or maybe another cloud machine, and then unzipping all the files, understanding their API, loading the TF record files, and then now they're ready to train a model. Instead, what we do a provide up here is a very easy installable through Python package um, management solution, a hub that you can get actually get started in five seconds by just loading this and get started working with the data. Now, in this case, the data actually gets preloaded while you are trying to work with it. Um, and then you can get sense of the data very fast. And then if you want, let's say, to get starting a training model, you don't have to wait until the whole data is copied. You can actually kickstart the training job and, and do that. And you will wonder, like, is this efficient or not? And what we show here on the next slide is that for a certain setup where you have the data set sitting on the same region or in the same cluster, but not necessarily on the same machine um, on, on the cloud, you can actually show that you can train, let's say in this case, ImageNet um, on data set of the ImageNet as if the data was local to the machine. So you can still store the data on S3 and then spin up a cluster of machines or a single machine um, and train the model. And you can see here with Actable Pub, like takes one hour and seven minutes. Um, as if you actually, if you look into the first mod they have on file mode, where, which upon your startup of the time, it actually copies the data um, to the machine, which takes three hours. And then you can now train the model as if, I mean, literally is local to the machine. So it's one hour, five minutes. They recently introduced another kind of abstraction over the S3 that appears to be like a file system, which they call it fast file mode. But now it actually takes like two hours. The startup time is fast, but um, the training time gets lo longer. And with using ActiveLob Hub, instead of treating this as files or um, folder structure, now you have an in-memory representation of this huge array that you can start kickstart like a training job 
very efficiently and easily um, from anywhere. And this could also work on a Google Cloud call-up or any notebook that you're running locally as well. The only thing that I want to mention, obviously here, we can't just bypass um, law of physics. So let's say you are based um, somewhere in New York and the data set itself is in San Francisco, then the time that it takes actually to physically move the data from one location to like, we're still bounded to the times there. So this works very well when the compute and the data center are physically nearby, but not necessarily on the same location. Uh, yeah, maybe I can take a step here and just want to open any questions um, um, from the audience people have. Yeah, feel free to uh, ask me any questions if we move forward or if there's any part that's unclear or you would like to get more details, maybe the demo will be helpful as well. So maybe we can take a step back and ask like, okay, what, what we are doing here and why we are doing this. Uh, the main reason for us is that we want to have a very profound or solid data foundation that we can iterate on the data sets much faster and then train the models subsequently in um, much quicker iterations and closing this loop and closing like the gap between training those iterations actually help us to um, improve the training process that we do on the models. Um, yeah, we also like uh, provide a browser view of the, let's say ImageNet data set that you can easily navigate through and explore the data set. Um, and the main idea that we want to give you a um, quick, um, so let me step back here as well is that usually when you do computer vision, um, more a lot of time is spent on inspecting the data, inspecting what the models had outputted, and also inspecting on understanding how um, originally the data set itself has been worked so far. Um, so I, I don't know if you have seen the recently there was an article at MIT um, Review which says 5% uh, of the uh, labels of the ImageNet are wrong. So imagine all the papers for the past seven years or eight years have been spent on training a model, trying to beat these benchmarks, but the 5% was introducing an inherent noise in the data that we were all basically wrong. <laughs> so, and the, you necessarily don't want this to happen uh, besides while you're doing this in production at a company where this model actually should make a, let's say, life-saving a decision. Um, it could be in self-driving cars, or it could be in robotics when using doing perception and so on. I see we do have a, a question from um, Joseph. Um, so the question is metrics on just how to close or limits of how far this data in your location should be. And what if, what is it if not an image database, but streaming sensor data you are trying to build a model on it? So the first question is, uh, it really depends on the um, infrastructure setup. Um, if the data is very, very big, um, then we have seen the cases where it's actually faster to hire a physical truck to move from one location to another location, um, given the, the distance is pretty big. But what worked very well, uh, we have had the case where we were training a model on our local cluster at, at the office, and the data set was actually stored on the um, on a, on US West 1 or West 2 data center and we had been able to utilize our GPUs 100%. And it was surprising for us as well because it, our network connection is not the best, but it was actually utilizing the whole um, setup. So there are many factors for saying this. First of all, it really depends on um, your, like your model capacity, meaning how much time actually it takes to do a single step in your uh, model. If the model is very big, then you have free time, a lot of free time to bring the data to the machine. But the main idea, what we were wanting to show you here is that even if your computation is data bottlenecked, having the data and the compute in the same region um, is, is first of all, very efficient in terms of the streaming is also economically um, cost efficient as well. Usually um, the cloud data centers, they do have, um, data egress fee when you move the data out from the data center they actually charge you so you don't want to do this while um, doing it across multiple regions and we have seen also companies using this on their on-prem clusters where they have a huge um, like let's say data center themselves and then they do the training with the storage to the training services so 
it works in a kind of, let's say, physically in the same data center or data region, that's for sure, given the network connectivity is high, of course. Um, and the rest, if you are not like looking for super performance, super performance, we have seen as well, you can run on a Google Colab and train a model while utilizing the GPU 100%. But it's like less likely if you are like on the state of the art side of training models. And the next question is, um, what if it's not an image database, but streaming sensor data and you're trying to build a model on it? Um, the way Hub operates is like agnostic to the data type you have. Um, so you can have um, any sensor data, you can have also like text data, audio data, and um, video data as well. We are soon releasing, pushing this out. Uh, the way we treat everything, I mean, it's not our invention or whatsoever, but like deep learning models, what they do is that they just take a tensor in and they output the tensor out. And that's how it works. So, and we, we do this initial step of taking all the data to a tensor form or an, like a large array form. So it's very native for deep learning frameworks to operate on top of this data without actually going and doing the whole um, preloading and transformation side of things. So if you have a sensor data, the sensor data, like you'd say, it could be LiDAR, radar data, and there are like other types of time series um, events that you might collect. Uh, we haven't seen that Hub is like mostly re very well utilized for that, but that could be a very good example and um, try out and see how it works. Um, there are a lot of nuances about um, how the data should be, let's say, like the models, when you train those models, they have the, uh, they expect actually the data to be shuffled. Um, so they, it comes in a random order and depending on a data set size um, or the sample size, then the shuffling can be affected. And we love to see, we're now looking actually into how this um, sample size is affecting the shuffling and inherently um, I, what is the impact on the models um, themselves. But yes, so sensor data works um, and also like you can have a near enough proximity to be able to stream the data to the training process. And one more, more thing I will mention as well here is that the, th there's a conceptually a big difference between, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but there's like this whole field of distributed computing or big data where you had MobReduce, then Hadoop, and then Spark as well. And the main idea is that when you spin up a cluster, you expect the data to kind of preload it to each of those machines, and then you run the compute there. In this case, it's sort of, you don't have this expectation. Your data can still be in a centralized location and accessed whenever you need it, but then you have some expectations on the computation itself. You, and it's called like data obliviousness. What it basically means that your let's say you're running a training loop, you know beforehand in five seconds that you're gonna buffer this data or prefetch the data. And same, very similar notion in video streaming where you have to prefetch uh, some kind of um, few frames or a few hundred frames. So you have a very smooth uh, watching a movie, et cetera, in a similar sense, but not exactly the way it works because then you have random shuffling and so on. Great. Um, yeah, and you can also inspect, uh, like you can go into zoom in into each of these elements, like you can check out it on app.actable.ai and try to look into the data and bounding boxes and masks. Um, and what we want to provide mostly is that instead of like looking super fancy, the main point for this is for you or for a data scientist to be able to zoom out, see what the data looks like, what is the data distribution, and then zoom in into a single sample and try to understand how the single sample will look like. So, and I have seen from my experience as well in computer vision that every time like I'm training a model, I want to look into the model outputs and it takes me a lot of time to actually understand how these model outputs are relevant or what I should do next to change my model or any part of the experiment to improve my models. So having a very good eye eyeballs like on, on the data set itself is quite important. Uh, before I go to next steps, basically what are the exact features? Um, I also want to show you like how this will look like on a, on a notebook that you were operating at. So here's just a prepared notebook that you can um, use our Python package. I don't know if you can see this, maybe just zoom in to make it clear. Um, you can just do p3 install hub 
And now you have the Python package that's ready for you to um, get started. And I'll show you how you can use this to create a data set and then train a model. So the very first thing, what you do is that you declare that, hey, take this S3 location. It's, by the way, instead of this S3 location, it could be uh, your local file system. It could be a Google Cloud storage location. It also could be, um, could be a hub, which is managed by us, Ectoloop Storage. Um, to, to run this. So then you'd, first of all, you declare that, hey, saying that I want to create this empty data set on the following location. Then I, um, here's you write some boilerplate code that does the following, just looks into the cars. So the, here, here I have a data set of cars um, that like just a very basic, like you want to do a classification of images where the cars are. And then you write this code that just to inspect all, all over. And the most important part that we try to make it as familiar as possible is that now you can take your data set object and create tensors. So the first tensor you create is images. Uh, and then you also can specify, let's say the compression type, or um, you just say H type, and then we'll infer a lot of information about it. Then you can specify now labels and also the importance. And the importance you can think of it as the model output or it could be like how important is the label itself for the model to learn so far. And more than that, you can also add some metadata tags on each either a dataset object itself or the images. And here I just basically loop over the all files collected from my cars locally and um, append all the images. I, I won't run this uh, notebook today, but just to give a clear understanding that that will take like um, two uh, minutes basically just operating on all the, like I think order of 10,000 images, uploading like uploading these images on S3 um, and being able to give us now a link back to be able to stream this data to the training process. So you just do appending um, and we have also a utility function that you can provide a, a image location and it will automatically load the image and then um, put it into an NumPy array and then push it forward. But this API essentially can take any um, NumPy array storage and very efficiently lay out on top of an S3 storage. And then you're able to basically take hub now dot load and, and you can actually do this from another machine. So it doesn't have to be on the same Jupyter notebook or the same machine and uh, get the tensors. Let's say now we have, you can see we have images, labels, importance. We can see um, the description or the metadata that has and also the camera um, location. And we can also have the class names, which have been part of the uploading process. And now you can also access the data as if this data is local to the machine by saying, hey, give me the this, or take the data set, give me the tensor that we just created. So this is importance. And then give me the thousand element and convert it to NumPy. So this will give you an array that has just one element inside of it. Instead, you can actually get multidimensional arrays. You can ask, hey, give me the data set images at zero. So this will give you an image and then you can actually visualize on, on your local Jupyter notebook. Where this thing shines is, oh, by the way, just want to make sure, uh, can you see the notebook or I was like going over the notebook? Oh yeah, oh, sorry about this. I think there's the issue with the, Okay, great. So let me just go over very quickly. So you have, you can here install hub, um, create the data set using the empty uh, and being able to go over the files. The files are stored here in this folder where you have the images, um, like just the images um, over the classification image. Now you have also a, uh, being able to create the data set, you can specify, okay, I want to create the tensor for images, for labels, for the importance. You can up the, update the uh, meta information there and then you can loop over the files that you have just created to upload the images per sample. And then you can have these images, labels and importance just going over again. So uh, yeah, let me just take a back step here and ask any, and you have any questions here. Mm -hmm. So most of the questions here are about, um, uh, let me go through each of them. What kind of uplink streaming speed for the data from on-premise to the AWS storage card for timing you have presented? 
Um, so this is running on the, the following notebook is running on the, um, I think on AWS again as well. But what we have seen is that it, uh, it really depends on, uh, like, as you mentioned about uplink um, part, then you're able to stream the data to the cloud. So we have seen um, some users actually from India uh, with 10 megabyte per second uploading huge data sets to US East, uh, but that was taking like uh, in terms of hours or maybe a day, days I will adopt, but hours definitely. Um, so yes, there's a lot of expectation on having a high speed uplink, but you can really operate with uh, 10 or 100 megabyte just uploading small data sets. If we are talking about large scale data sets, then um, we can, we'll expect much higher. I believe Erin is raising and um, do you want do you want to? Um, oh, I, I need to allow you to talk. Great. Um, Erin, do you want to ask the question? Uh, if you don't mind typing there, because I can hear that will be awesome. Mm -hmm. So the next question is about which tools are utilized to reduce noise in data and how. Um, let me let me answer this question again later as well um, because this this is a very important question. I don't want to overgo through. And there's a the follow up question: When data consists of thousand color images, what does understand your data mean? Um, the the main like understanding here is about um, as like humans like you want to draw flow like you you want to understand you, you want to get an understanding of the distribution of the data. Obviously, you don't want to just get a distribution of how pixels are um, allocated across all images, but you want to get a sense on how data works. Like there's one big convention in computer vision specifically which says, hey if your human eye cannot detect an object or let's say classify this image or maybe do the segmentation as with human eyes, you definitely can't train a model that does this. So um, at least for now, that's the <laughs> currently, that's the state of the art, uh, which, the, and then well, what it means is that understanding your data is that you're looking into your data and if you can't being a knowledge expert in the problem that you are solving, not being able to classify this, for, on the computer vision data, not, not sensor data or anything else, then it's very hard for computer vision models to be able to do that. Um, and getting a sense there is very important. Regarding um, reducing the noise part, there are very uh, famous uh, tool that I mentioned um, that has been able to demonstrate 5% on finding the image errors built by Northcott from MIT. And he actually, um, shows that there's an open source um, tool called CleanLab that you're able to use on your data set to understand how, let's say the you have a data set of images and then you have the labels and what are the labels that actually do not correspond to the, to the images. And there's various methods. You can train and overfeed a model and try to understand if the given label is actually out of the expectations from the model that was trained on the images to identify if this is a um, is potentially an error, a mislabel, or a human error to, when while it was being labeled, and it ha it is it is occurring a lot of times. So have to be very careful with those models. The next question is about will the network streaming cost go up? Secondly, outside a few developed countries, network is not that good. Uh, if you um, are training and streaming the data inside the cloud, I mean, you do, you do provide the, you pay for the cloud fees for renting the GPUs and also like very minimal fee for on the, on the storage side. But if they are in the same region, then the cost is free. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, we, if you use Actilo, by the way, um, storage that we use behind the scenes as well for our, our side, egress fee is free. So, um, the charge there is only for the storage, which is also like not that very expensive. Um, and yes, um, I'm originally, by the way, from Armenia, and uh, we and we have like a lot of friends and um, trying to use the system. 
in that case, like let's say if you're like a, further apart from the data center, nearby data center, and like AWS has a lot of zones, but there are some cases where uh, the nearby data center is super far as well, and you don't want to do the, run the computation there, you want to run the computation locally, then we will like highly advise you to copy the data or the stream the data at once and then cache it locally while you're training the model. In PyTorch that I'm, I'm planning to show you later is that you have the feature where you can like is local cache true in that case the data set will be just copied once and then stored locally and the next iteration of the epoch will be um, all being able to train uh, and the next question is like does the um, system itself allow for any data normalization and the answer is correct and here we can see we loaded the data set uh, we have the data set being loaded, now we actually are able to apply a transformation on the data and, th and then we have the normalization as we expect. Um, we define the sim very simple transform. And the nice thing about Hub now, you don't have to go and write this whole class of uh, PyTorch that you usually should write to load the data, how, explain how the things should be run. And now you have a one-liner with just us that ds.pytorch after it has been being um, loaded. And you provide number of workers, number of the, like the transformation that you're applying. Potentially, you can also mention that, hey, cache my data locally. And you don't have to worry about how the cache is being done and the batch size. And then you have now the PyTorch data loader that you can go bring it to the same loop as you have for your training. Um, and, and you can see here is the model just being described. And you can give it to the same model as you have been giving any data loader to your model and then iterate on top of this data. And now you directly get uh, PyTorch tensors. And then if you run this code, what you will see is that the GPU utilization actually starts from small, but then now it converges to 90 to 95% um, being as fast. And if, as we showed in here, like if the data was local to the machine. Um, great. And I think one more question from um, Jake, uh, how can small companies use their unstructured data? I think to do this kind of machine learning project will investment. Uh, the nice thing as well, uh, from our side as well, we do provide uh, free um, storage for you to be able to store the data um, and being able to push, let's say to go Google Cola, which is free to train very small uh, models. You can also, um, I think the small, small companies, what I've seen work very well is that either AWS provides a very a free um, like um, credit for you to use and train models and to you and the credit can go up to 100K, $1,000 uh, for a year and you can use this for free. Um, or there are a lot of um, very efficient, cost-efficient services that if you don't want to pay to the public clouds you either um, and acquire an architecture yourself that you can use free open source or uh, open notebooks or infrastructure to train models while um, you go and like prove the other parts of the business itself. I hope that answered the question. If not, just feel free to ask me again. Um, there is another question. Um, are you going to share these notebooks with us? Uh, yes, um, after, I think after the call, we can follow up with, uh, we have documentation, we have all this call, we have also call ups there that you can give a try and then start it. But yes, definitely we will um, follow up with the notebooks. Let me switch the, yeah, thanks Mikhail for sharing the notes there. Mm -hmm. So one thing I would like also to um, show that you can, you can now, you can also go to app.activable.ai. Let's say we, we are want to see ImageNet data set that is, available so and then we can we are able to visualize sometimes the zoom is not very good for visualizing um, the data or the streaming but what you can do is that you can go to this link or you can go and search any data set as well you have and the main goal for this is being able to very quickly to visualize your data sets and then you can also finally rotate and explore like okay so let's say what's the first image of the um yeah, image data set. And there are more complicated uh, data sets that you can look into, let's say Coco, which aside from just having labels, you also have 
uh, segmentation or masks of it and you can explore the data pre pretty quickly. So this is just a sneak view of um, the tool that we do provide and it's free to use open to get started uh, easily with the open source tool that we have. Let me go through the um, final bits and pieces of the presentation and I'll get back to the answering any questions you have there. So yeah, and um, those are the, um, the actual kind of hub features where we do provide you an easy way to store it on the cloud very easily to stream the data from location. And, and one more time to repeat is that you can use this uh, open source for free on your local setup um, and there's no any charge and we are ha happy to help you out to get everything up and running. You can integrate with your favorite tools or annotation um, services. And soon we are also pushing, I mean, it's already pushed, it's but in beta um, version control that now you can have a data set in a single state. And then now you can start evolving this data by adding more um, examples, or let's say you can check out to a new branch, apply a transformation, train a model, and see actually if this transformation was useful to, to your model, and if not, check out back and then continue building like as if you were operating on a Git. So this helps you to keep track of how your data sets are being evolved over the time, especially if you have sensor data, then your data sets getting increased over the time, and you have to keep track of when things have been committed to the data set. You can apply transformation on the data, you can take an image, let's say rotate 90 degrees and then check out to a new branch and then store this data. And then sometimes you, as you go large and the data set is, itself is very large, you have to take care of not just running this on a local machine, but how can I utilize like a thousand core um, machine instances on the cloud to be able to do that. And soon we will see as well, like being able to query the data, very, being able to search, hey, give me all the images that have a uh, bicycle running, or yeah, with a running person, or there's like something else, then we will see the filtering how that happens either on a data set uh, view of that I just showed, or in your code, now you are able to say, okay, give me a subset of my images, let's say dogs, combined with another subset of images from another data set that has cats, and then I want to train a model that classifies dogs and cats from two totally different data sets um, and improve that. Um, yeah, this is basically it. Thank you um, very much for your attention. Um, so feel free to join our slack.actable.ai that you can um, have any hub related questions that we are happy to answer. Um, furthermore, I think Mika mentioned like, if you um, mentioned that you are coming from Magnemind, we're more than happy to provide additional uh, free storage up to 500 GB on our platform for you when we launch uh, the tool to get you up and running. Um, and I do believe that I have answered all the questions from um, the audience, but feel free to ask me any questions you have. Okay, that's it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a great event. Thank you so much, David. So I personally want to thank you. Uh, Many mind events will continue, and we hope to see you. We hope to see you in the next event. Goodbye. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Thank you. Bye. Bye.